All right. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. I'd like to introduce um, Richard Schneider, who is a conservation biologist who has worked on species at risk and land use planning in Alberta for the past 30 years. Um, a new open access version of his book, Biodiversity Conservation in Canada from Theory to Practice, is now available um, on openeducationalberta.ca slash Schneider. He currently uh, serves as the editor-in-chief of the Nature Alberta magazine and um, for the past four years served as the executive director of Nature Alberta. Welcome, Rick. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for making time this evening to spend some time talking about climate change. Uh, so the work I'm going to cover here is um, from a project I was involved with uh, with the Alberta Bio Biodiversity Monitoring Institute uh, some years ago now. Um, but I'm uh, really tailoring it for uh, naturalists of all stripes, so it's not a technical talk so much as a, a guide to what we can expect uh, in Alberta in, in coming decades. So uh, climate change, you can look at it in a lot of different ways. I'm, I'm going to look at it for a very broad uh, provincial scale. So we're looking at, at entire ecosystems here today. Uh, and of course, in Alberta, we've got uh, five main ones, boreal forest, parkland, and grasslands. And then over to the west, we have the foothills and Rockies, which are, are each uh, different ecosystems. Uh, and, and I'm leaving out the shield. We have a bit of shield up in the far northeast, but uh, in, in interest of time, I'm not going to be uh, talking about that today. So if we look at it from a uh, uh, provincial perspective, where, where are these things? Uh, I'm sure you're generally familiar. We've got grasslands, and I'm presuming you can see my mouse here in the on the bottom here. Uh, grasslands in the south, then parkland to the north of that, and then a strip along the uh, edge of the mountains here. And then most of the north is all boreal forest, of course, and we've got foothills here merging into the Rocky Mountains. So for landscape ecologists or ecologists of all stripe, uh, you know, what they love doing is uh, describing the distribution of, of things, plants and animals. Why are they where they are? And that's a really good starting place for us to understand climate. It's the foundation for us to make any kind of predictions about what's going to happen in the future. So I'm going to start from that perspective. Let's take a walk through our understanding today as in um why are things the way they are? What, how can we explain the current distribution of our ecosystems? And as I said, I'm mostly going to be talking at the very broad natural region scale. This map here shows you one step finer with subregions, uh, but, but like I say, I'll, I'll be staying fairly broad. So uh, it turns out we can actually explain most of what we see with just two main uh, gradients, if you will, axes. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is this latitudinal gradient, gradient. So if you get in your car in Medicine Hat, and thanks to the people in the grasslands, for, I should have forgot to say, to, is setting up this talk and encouraging me to give it. So uh, uh, it was their, their idea. So if you get in your car there and you start to drive north, you, you start with short grass prairie. The grass is a very drought tolerant. And as you move north, grass gets a little taller. And eventually you start seeing some clumps of aspen as you move into the parkland here. And that aspen, as you continue to move north, gets denser until finally this light green color here is the dry mixed wood. It's essentially a closed aspen forest. And finally, when you're Getting closer to Fort McMurray, you're in the true central mixed wood boreal forest, which is a mixture of aspen and various conifers. So um, if we look at the, um, you know, reasons why these different ecosystems are structured the way they are, it really boils down to water. Uh, you need a lot more water to grow a spruce tree than you need to grow a clump of grass. And so uh, if we look at it, it actually turns out to be the case. However, it's not quite as simple as 
uh, what falls to the ground. You might think, well, yeah, it's not that rainy down in Medicine Hat, and as you go north, it just rains more, and that's why we have forests there. Not quite. Um, if we look at the annual precipitation for the province, we see that it's actually a, a, a fairly confused pattern. Uh, but importantly here, uh, you know, I don't have the cities on here, but my pointers around Edmonton and going down toward Calgary, this stripe here, well, look at the amount of precipitation, this red color. Well, it's about the same as what you find in most of the boreal. In fact, if you go up to the very north part of the province, you're approaching some of the low levels of rainfall than we see in the dry part of the prairie. And yet this is grassland and this is boreal forest. So how do we square that? It's not simply pre precipitation. The answer is that uh, it's what matters is water in the ground. Um, it's the ground moisture that, that determines the, the type of growth you have. And ground moisture is a factor of two things. Yes, it's precipitation, it's what comes in, but it's also a, a matter of what is lost. And so uh, we have to include evaporation. That's the key thing here. So when you're out in the, uh, the grasslands here and it's the middle of August and the sun's beating down, that soil is just baked dry. You, you're, you, you know that from your own experience. But as you move north, it's getting cooler and cooler and cooler until you get to an area where the amount of evaporation, it's still occurring, but uh, it's not fully offsetting what's coming in as pre precipitation. There's that, there's that tipping point. And in the north, we are still within the zone where you can grow a tree. And down here in the south, we're, we're past that. We're past the tipping point. And, and over the broad landscape, it's, it's a grassland and not a, not a forest. Now, this photo here is, is this everything I've talked about so far in a microcosm. This is a tributary of the Battle River in central Alberta. Um, when we're looking here at a, at a, it's going east and west. So here on the northern bank, we've got short grasses. You'll find even scattered bits of cactus around here. Down in the bottom, we've got a, a, a nice robust uh, white spruce forest. And up on the other, on the bank here on the south side, we've got a mixture of aspen and, and spruce. And so while this looks like a, you know, a calm, serene scene, it's actually the site of a pitched battle. Each one of the plants that you're looking at here is fighting with all the other plants. It's fighting for nutrients, it's fighting for water, it's fighting for sunlight. And each of the species has their own, we call them superpowers, if you will, uh, their ability to do really well under certain conditions. So here where it's it's dry, right, There, all of these plants receive the same amount of moisture falling from the sky, but uh, on the slopes, the water's running down, and so the trees down the bottom get the most moisture. Uh, on the slope here, this is facing right into the sun. In the summer, you know, this is facing directly south and, again, drying out the land. So only the hardiest uh, of grasses can make a go of things here. Um, each one of the different species you know, their abilities comes into play. So when they are situated in their optimal conditions, they will they will dominate. So you don't find any trees here because the grasses are much better at growing in a dry environment. And the other way around down here, uh, you know, the spruce trees are slow growing, but once they establish and grow, they'll shade out everything underneath it. That's their superpower. So uh, we've, we're seeing the, the scene of an ongoing battle and over enough time, you can think of it as nature equilibrating. Every everything finds its own best spot. You know, and, and here you'll see there's a couple of spruce trees trying to make a go out of their, you know, optimal habitat. And maybe they'll make it, maybe not. Um, but but by and large, things try eventually sort their way out. And this is critical to us understanding what's going to happen with climate change in the future. It's a, a fundamental piece of the picture that uh, species all have their individual adaptations and they grow best where their the environment suits them the best or where they suit their environment the best, probably a better way of putting that. 
So that explains our, our gradient here going from north to south. Um, we also have to then now look at a second gradient, which is essentially going uphill. So we're going up the foothills into the mountains. The same thing applies up here in the north. These uh, circles here, these are all part of a boreal hill system. They're not as tall as the mountains, but they're definitely elevated over the plain. This is all a, a flat plain over here. So uh, as you're going uphill, you're again uh, going through a gradient. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure most of you have, have taken a hike at some point up or, or you know, in the mountain somewhere. And you, you've seen that, right? As you start in the bottom, the lower foothills, there's predominantly a mixed wood forest, aspen and different conifers. And then as you move up, uh, you're getting into a different kind of ecosystem. We've got now pure conifer, different species, depending on where you are up that gradient. And eventually you're going to get past the tree line. And again, only grass and some hardy shrubs and so will make it. So in this case, it's again, it's a temperature gradient, uh, maybe a little more moisture up on the top. But uh, it's it's a really a, a key here. What I'm driving home is it's climate. Uh, it's not soils. It's not seed source. It's not um you know local factors it's it, we're talking broad scales it really is climate that's driving these patterns so if i haven't convinced you of that yet i've got a couple more uh um, ways to go at this uh, what i'm showing here is the province uh in terms of climate zones i just had a statistical program generate 12 different climate zones where in every zone the climate is essentially similar so everything in the brown here is is you know the climate is is, is basically similar and if we compare that to the natural regions you should have the oh my gosh and say geez <laughs> you know we we really can explain most of what we see in terms of broad climatic patterns. I mean, sure, it get pretty, gets pretty messy here in the boreal. Uh, it's not a perfect fit, but but if you stand back, you got to say, geez, you know, we're explaining a large part of the uh, distribution of our ecosystems just simply on, on climate. Now, um, the, what we're going to move into here, that's the end of this kind of fundamentals, our explanation of what, why things are the way they are. Uh, I'm going to switch now to uh, ask the question, well, what happens when we start monkeying around with this system, start changing the climate? Well, we've already run that experiment once in the past. If you go back roughly, you know, four, six thousand years ago, uh, Alberta, all of Canada was a lot warmer than it is today. Um, you know, we glacial cycles, or there are glacial periods are cyclical, and it has a lot to do with the uh, orbit of the Earth around the sun and our tilt and so on. So there's, you know, it, you have a little bit more and a little bit less amount of sun energy hitting the Earth, or at least in the north. And uh, we actually hit our maximum long ago. We're not there now. It happened about four, six thousand years ago. So Alberta was somewhere in the range of two to three degrees warmer then. And um, people, researchers have gone out over the years and study the past by taking cores of the mud in uh, different lakes all around the province. So if you think of a lake as a sort of a basin where everything eventually finds its home, flows in from the sides, uh, the pollen from the vegetation around, around the region will all end up in the bottom of the lake. And as time goes on, those layers mount up. And if you take a core through, you can go back through time. And they've done that and they've analyzed the pollen and they've come up with a rough picture. Now, I, it, this map is exaggerated in terms of the detail. and we, They don't know exactly where the boundaries are, but the general idea here, again, comparing today versus 6,000 some odd years ago, we definitely see that our grasslands, which are down here today, were quite a bit farther north. Uh, they've kind of encompassed the whole parkland region. Today's parkland was, was grassland. Then, and the parkland shifted northward. So, you know, what today is dry mixed wood, this pure aspen forest, well, that was parkland back then. And the same goes for peace country here. And, of course, no big surprise. You know, we've got Grand Prairie here. That was not named by accident. There really are prairies there or were before agriculture. And those small grasslands, they, they carry on throughout the whole uh, in small patches throughout the whole uh, Peace River area here. So that area was expanded in the past. 
and um, it gives us, you know, evidence that what I'm putting forward as an idea that uh, plants and animals that follow the plants will move as the climate shifts. They will track their optimal environment. That that is the fundamental idea that all of the climate projections that I'm going to tell you in, in the next few minutes are hinged on. It's on on this idea that plants live where their environment is optimal for them. And when we change the climate, as we did in the Hipsa thermal, plant, plants will move over a long time. This doesn't happen over a few years. We're talking over hundreds of years. They slowly, that battle that I said between all the different species and they're each exerting their own attributes and their own uh, abilities, uh, they will equilibrate, equilibrate eventually into a new pattern. And this is roughly speaking uh, what the pattern was like uh, 6,000 years ago. So now let's look at the future. This is what we're really interested, right? We're doing all this work about today so we can understand the processes so that we can then look forward to the future and see what's in store. Now, the first step is to uh, understand what the climate is going to do. And, you know, we need a crystal ball for that. We, we, it's, it's very hard to predict. There's so many variables uh, in large part having to do with us, right? I mean, how much climate mitigation are we really going to do? Are we going to meet the uh, targets uh, that we have set? Or are we going to go over them? Uh, you know, those are hard things to predict. And then there's all the physical variables about how climate works and so on. So we don't have a precise prediction of what's going to happen over time. Uh, but we have been trying. There's well over 20 teams uh, in universities around the globe, countries all over, have developed models climate models that they uh, uh, use to predict what they believe is going to happen in coming decades. And they do that under different scenarios, like a best case scenario, if we <clears throat> globally get our act together and we institute mitigation measures, measures or if we don't. <laughs> uh, so they run different scenarios and each model is a little bit different because nobody knows exactly the right way to do it. They, you know, the people that know climate modeling have different ideas and they don't all agree. So the point here is that we have 20 some odd models of the future. Yeah, you can't just rely on one. And I'm showing you a graph of uh, different scenarios and different models kind of all splashed onto one page. The two different axes here are precipitation on the y-axis. Okay, we're looking at 2080s, right? Far into the future. And we're saying, what is there gonna be, what the change in precipitation can we expect at that uh, future point in time? And on the x-axis, we're asking how much warmer is it going to be? So the x-axis is temperature. And we see there's a scattering. Uh, the models don't all agree on, on how warm it's going to get or how wet or, or whatever. But there are a couple of things to keep in mind. One is, even though there's a lot of variability here, look, there's not a single model that says we're not going to warm by at least two degrees. There's complete agreement on that, that given the amount of CO2 that we've already released, into the atmosphere, we're on the track to at least two degree warming. They all agree, uh, agree on that. The question is how much more? Uh, the same with precipitation. Um, there's less, uh, there's more variability on this, less certainty about what's happening with precipitation, but most of the models think that there's gonna be more uh, rather than less. And I, I forgot to say, this is uh, data for Alberta, specifically for Alberta, not for the globe or Canada or whatever. So most models suggest we'll have more rather than less precipitation. There's a couple that say there'll be less, but by and large, they think there's more. Um, there's a caveat to that in that, um, yes, there'll be more overall. Uh, this is over a whole year. Um, but uh, in the summertime, uh, the general prediction is that there could be less or at least not an increase during summertime, which is pretty critical for vegetation growth. Um, but anyway, this is what we're looking at. So what I'm going to present to you is I'm going to focus on a best case. I'm calling it a best case scenario. That's uh, this green dot here is that if we only rise by two or 2.5 degrees, what will the future look like? And then I look at a worst case out here, this kind of purplish dot. Uh, what if we went all the way to six degrees? Because we don't know where we're going to end up. It's going to be somewhere between those boundaries. And I'll, I'll present that. So let's start by looking just at the temperature. That's the key to all of this, right? Um, is how warm is it going to get? Now let's look first at our current. 
uh, temperature. So this is a map of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and some of the northern states. Uh, the exact temperature doesn't matter. What I'm showing here is that there are bands as, as you go north northward, it's getting cooler, right? That, that part is, is clear. Now, uh, the reason I put the northern states in, in here is that as we warm, we're going to start to experience temperatures that they today experience in the northern states. So the question is, how much? So under the best case scenario, which is shown in this map here, so a, a roughly a two degree plus uh, rise in temperature, what we're going to see is that these temperatures today around Lethbridge and Medicine Hat, they're moving up. They're, they're now in Edmonton. Edmonton's looking at a Lethbridge kind of temperature at the end of the century. Uh, same goes when you start to look for uh, Calgary in the future, you have to go down, you know, down here to South Dakota and in, in lower parts of Montana to see equivalent temperatures. Uh, things get really hairy is when you when you move to the worst case, you know, six degrees. Now we're really going into uncharted territory there. I mean, just look at here. The Lethbridge kind of temperatures are at the NWT border. Now, if you think at six degrees doesn't sound like much, uh, yeah, it actually is a lot when you look at you know, what it looks like on a landscape scale. Edmonton's going to have kind of temperatures that you see today in southern Montana. And geez, down in, in the South Lethbridge, you're looking at southern Idaho and Nevada, you know, as far as comparable temperatures, if you find the equivalent today. So we're talking about a huge change. So what will happen? What happens when we increase the temperature, given everything I've told you about equilibration over time and and uh, ecosystems or species finding their their optimal niche um well if we look at the, the 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 kinds of vegetation in the northern states we can say that given a, a, a best case scenario we're going to look at montana temperatures well what does montana look like today well it's a grassland uh the species mix is a little different than we have today uh but it's still going to be a grassland so, you know, it's a kind of a livable change. If we go to the other extreme and we look at those really hot temperatures under the worst case scenario, and we're going all the way to southern Idaho, we're now looking at a, a much more like a sage kind of landscape. It's not baked earth desert, you know, like the Mojave, but um, it's really dry and, uh, you know, it's not like a kind of grassland we know today. Pretty big change there. Uh, the other thing that'll happen in the grassland and parkland is, um, well, first of all, it has to do with sand. You know, when you go around the province today, you don't see much. It's all covered and vegetated almost everywhere you go. There's a few spots where it pokes out, like around Wainwright, you can see open sand dunes, but mostly it's covered with vegetation. But as it gets drier, again, the heating is going to cause more evaporation, right? So even if we get a little more moisture, we get a lot more heat, and that's driving the moisture out of the ground. And so uh, you we're going to see that transition to grass and drier periods and, and during a drought, you might see some of these sandy areas open up and we might, you know, be seeing open sand dunes. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, the southern uh, parkland and grassland, well, this is the pothole region. This is where we grow you know, a huge amount of ducks every year because there are these small ponds. Uh, they, some of them are ephemeral, but most of them stick around uh, most of the year. And then we've got our, you know, the lakes a little bit bigger and so on. Well, again, with the drying, especially in the summer, if we don't get a lot of summer moisture, we're going to see that uh, decline in area. There's going to be fewer ponds. They'll dry up sooner. And, you know, again, it depends on how hot it gets. If it's um, if it's the best case, uh, you know, there's still going to be ponds there. They, they just maybe not last as long, not as big. Worst case, you, we're looking at drying up most of it. Uh, in the, I didn't mention it, but in the hypsothermal, a lot of the lakes that are considered lakes, Miquelon Lake, Hastings Lake, Wobbleman Lake, I'm not so sure about the south, they were dry. They were bone dry. Um, and so uh, we are looking at a lot of moisture loss if, if we're, we're looking at the worst case scenario. Definitely something, you know, we want to avoid. And I'll get to that at the end. It really will matter, you know, how far we go. Uh, okay, switching to the boreal then. A good more than half of the province is boreal. Um, the, uh, we'll start by looking at the dry mixed wood. This is that closed aspen forest mostly. 
uh, we're going to be looking at transitioning to parkland. I've kind of alluded to that already, and we saw that in the hypsothermal. So an opening up of the aspen forest with some, some uh, patches of grass. And again, depending on how, hydro, how dry it gets, those will be more extensive or less. And we're, we're like I, I mentioned, we're already well on the way. This peace country, why are they farming up there? It's because of the unique uh, you know, temperature situation in that area, it's in the Peace Valley, um, it already was prairie in big chunks around Grand Prairie. There naturally were large prairies there. It's quite unique. Uh, you won't find that in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. That'll just expand. I've, I've mentioned that along the Peace River, there are patches of grassland. They're just going to get bigger. So how much? It will depend on how far we go along that warming curve. Uh, in turn, the uh, uh, central mixed wood, the, the massive plain of mixed wood forest that uh, comprises most of the boreal forest is slowly going to transition to uh, more of the dry mixed wood. So uh, more of a predominance of aspen rather than the predominance of, of spruce and, and other uh, conifers. Uh, an interesting side point here is that uh, one of my themes is what we're going to do. I'm just going to jump forward and say uh, to help animals adapt. If, if we can slow down the rate of change, that's going to be quite important because uh, species can adapt. But, you know, the pace of change is so fast today, it's going to be hard for many of them. So if we can slow down that rate of change, we will be helping uh, those, those species adapt. And we can do that through forestry actually. So, you know, throughout my career, forestry was always the bad guy. You know, we were fighting against clear cuts and all the rest. Well, it turns out that by growing seedlings in nurseries and then tending them after, we might be able to slow down the natural rate of pro progression under a hot climate. So uh, that'll be interesting to see how that, that works out. Um, of course, under a worst case scenario, it's gonna be hard. Uh, to, you know, it's going to be go a lot farther in that transition. And we're going to see open grass lines, even in the central mixed wood. So it really depends on how much. Now, an interesting side note to the boreal is that a large proportion, like almost a third, is underwater of some kind. Not big lakes there, but there are these enormous peatlands. So this, uh, you know, there's no, it's too wet. It's, it's waterlogged underneath there. So, you know, you can't grow tall spruce trees. Black spruce make it sometimes. Uh, anyway, there's a lot of water here underneath, and uh, the, the, the peat, the moss on the top, acts like an insulating blanket. So even though it's going to get warmer, um, the research suggests that it's going to take a long, long time before that peat actually dries. And so there's this potential for brand new kinds of forest in the north where you have kind of a, a peatland remnant holding water and then deciduous aspen around it with their roots kind of stuck into the water and making a go of it. No, nobody knows for sure, but they, you know, there's these ideas percolating about, you know, what might that look like under a, on a warmer climate? And it, it might be quite different than today. Uh, lastly, just to mention that the uh, hill system, you know, they're higher, so they're cooler. That's where the last bastions of boreal forest will be, even under the worst case uh, scenario. They, this boreal subarctic now, it's permafrost. It's uh, really uh, a, a tough place to make a living today. Well, as it warms up, that will become more typical of what you'd see in the southern boreal. So that will be our refuge for, for boreal species. Now, the, I haven't made this point before, but what I, I need to make right here is this doesn't happen quickly. The temperature will change much earlier than the ecosystems will change. There's a lag, a substantial lag. You know this if you, you know, drive around the prairie and you see these farm farmsteads with tall spruce growing around them. I mean, they're way out of their normal element, yet they're, there they are growing. Well, if you tend a small tree and get it through that critical, vulnerable seedling stage, an adult spruce will withstand a lot. It'll, it'll grow. It lives just fine on the open prairie. Um, so the existing forest that's there today will stay there a long time, even after the climate changes to the point where it's not optimal anymore. But uh, forests, well, they grow old and die, but in, in our northern boreal, well, across all of Canada, uh, 
we have fire resetting the successional clock. And so fire will be the real driver behind uh, transitions. It, if we've got, of course, fire there today, and it doesn't mean wherever it burns today, it's going to transition to grassland. No, the climate hasn't moved enough yet. So if there's a burn today, as it was this past summer, it's going to regrow back to forest. But those maps I showed you, once it gets to the point of, of that passing, the tipping point, where it's not optimal and the vulnerable seedlings are exposed to that suboptimal uh, climate, you're going to have regeneration failures. And at first, Aspen's going to take over. And on, when in, in worse conditions, eventually, you know, grass. And it's going to not happen quickly. Uh, fire rate is increasing, but it's not going to happen right away. We're, we're talking about a start in the latter half of this century and carrying on well into the next century. So climate will happen first, transitions will happen later. Uh, if you're interested in this specific topic of fire and what's going to happen, uh, I've got a feature article coming out in the next issue of um, Nature Alberta magazine. So, so we want to have a take a, a look at that if that's of interest to you. Um, ending off, I'm just going to touch quickly here on the foothills and the Rockies. Um, I said the, the transitions there, it's an elevational gradient, so it's reasonably straightforward. We've got the, the ecosystems of the boreal plain will slowly move into the foothills. Foothills will move into the subalpine, up alpine into the alpine. Everything is like taking an elevator going up slope. Okay, so the patterns, you kind of know what they are today. It's just that they are at a lower elevation. They're going to move up, and it's already happening. Uh, researchers have, are finding aspen at elevations where they've never been seen in the past. So um, after clear cut, I should say, so there's that lag still. But if you clear cut an area, uh, you, you're seeing that there is uh, the start, an early start of, of transitions. But the key point to take home here is there's not an expectation of losing that forest. It should stay forested, even under a worst case scenario, because uh, even with a higher rate of evaporation, it'll never, it will never reach the tipping point. You know, the foothills and mountains, they're wet, right? That, that they're, they, it's the prairies in behind that are in the rain shadow. The foothills still capture a lot of moisture. So it will become, if anything, more productive uh, with more with more or warmer temperatures. It will not transition to a you know, big grassland like the, like the uh, boreal will. So the last part of my presentation is on uh, the question of, it's a sort of a so what? Okay, it's gonna get warm. So what? Uh, we know that um, we're, it, it, this is sort of the experiment. I was going to, I forgot about this. If you say, well, here's our pattern today, and we're going to warm it all up, isn't that the same as just moving it all north or upslope in the case of the foothills? And if that's the case, what's the big deal? It's just change its location. Every, everything's still there. Well, um, there is some truth to that. Change is not the same as loss. Um, we know that uh, all of the species in Alberta, all the species in Canada, essentially, were, were wiped out right during the last glaciation. They've all had to move. They're all survivors. They were down in the States, and they moved back up into Canada, back up into Alberta. So they have the innate capacity to shift their range when they need to. So does that mean all is well? Not quite. There are some caveats to that, and they're you know unique to our point in time versus how things were in the past. First of all, a lot of the species that we have today are struggling. Um, the, in the past, you know, there were, there were few, I have to think about when, when this happened, uh, the worst uh, indigenous people had come in, but were not very prevalent in those very first post glacial times. Um, there's, there's some controversy about when they arrived. But the point was there was no industrialization of the landscape, right? So today we have a transformed landscape. We've got forestry, we've got oil and gas, we've got roads, we've got peat mining, it goes on and on. Um, and a lot of our species are struggling. And so their ability to withstand disturbance is lower than it would be if they were in their normal population density, their normal range, everything is going uh, well for them. So I've, I've got Burring Owl here as an example. You, you might think that, 
well, they're a grassland species. And I've told you that grasslands are expanding into the north. Isn't that great? I mean, aren't we looking at a flourishing of boreal owls in the province? Well, it could be, except boreal owls are really struggling. Most of their habitat has been plowed under. And so they are actually contracting to their core range, range in, the, in the northern United States. They're not expanding northward because they, they don't have the capacity to do so. I mean, that wouldn't happen anyway because the transitions haven't happened yet, to be clear about that. But the point is, they are not primed to move northward. They're actually moving in the wrong direction. They're moving southward because that's their core range. And in, in, in Canada, where we're at the fringe of their range, they are, are really struggling and, and we're losing them year after year. Uh, you can't expect them to, to adapt very easily. The other, uh, another issue is there are barriers. In the past, when climate changed, there were no barriers. It was all open. Today, we've got, you know, you know, is grassland species going to move north easily? No, they've got these agricultural landscapes they have to move through. That will slow them down. Some of the species just, <laughs> they don't move very fast. Uh, the, it, it, if you look at this episode of climate change, it's all being packed into, you know, 100, 200 years. Uh, in the past, it took many hundreds and usually thousands of years for these climatic changes to occur. So this good old salamander had all the time in the world to track north or south or wherever he needed to go. That's not the case this time. There, there are going to be species that struggle to keep up, and we may have to uh, uh, help them out in that regard. Uh, another factor to keep in mind is um, the landscapes aren't natural anymore. There's a lot of non-native species, especially when we're talking vegetation. There are countless power lines, pipelines, road corridors um, that have been reseeded to agricultural grasses, non-native grasses. They're out there. And so if there's going to be a regeneration failure because of the climate being too warm, these guys are going to be ready to jump in. We may not get a natural grassland. There, you're going to have a competition with non-native species. Uh, last but not least, there's us. Um, uh, this is one that certainly keeps me up uh, at night. Uh, I, I have here a quote from a, a, a researcher in Saskatchewan who said, uh, it may be possible to open up new agricultural areas north of Prince Albert. As the length of the growing season increases, Perhaps the present boreal plain can be the new bread basket of the country. So <laughs> there are people waiting, uh, you know, instead of saying, hey, this is great new grassland habitat for boreal owls. Uh, no, this is going to be a great wheat field. So that struggle, I think, will play out again. And there's another sort of uh, a note to self that we should try to get ahead of the game and make sure we uh, start protected areas today. Well, you know, it's 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 uh, there's not a lot of economic value necessarily there. Uh, anticipating that they may might make great grassland uh, protected areas in the future. So just to uh, finish up, some comments about conservation. Um, it does it does take a big mind shift. Uh, you know, I've, I've been in this game for a while and they, you know, we've always talked about needing a baseline. The pre-industrial forest was our touchstone. You know, we can monkey with things like cut down trees and, and you know, harvest them and then, you know, replant it. But our, our goal was to make sure that that regrowing forest was going to be looking like the pre-industrial version that was there before. Whatever we did, there was that kind of... Uh, static view of the the world and that our job as conservationists was to try you know understanding it was hard to get there but to try to keep things as natural as they were in the past before industrial change transformed everything well now we've got a moving target so the pre-industrial baseline isn't going to work anymore we've got to have some kind of goal still for conservation but it can't be a static fixed goal so this version kind of works it says maintain ecosystems species genetic diversity as they would be in the absence of human disturbance so the focus here is on human disturbance and that really is what conservation really is all about it's undoing the damage that we do when we go out there and harvest resources. If 
the uh, ecosystem isn't the same as it used to be, that's okay. Uh, if it's got grassland now, we want it to be a, a healthy grassland, one that has the full complement of grassland species, uh, not, a, not a canola field. So we can still do conservation, but we have to be a little bit more flexible. Here's an example of that. Uh, you know, reclamation has always been a thing that uh, oil companies had to, um, you know, after they've done with taking a well out, they have to reclaim the site back to what it was, or foresters have to reforest the way it was. But the way it was isn't necessarily the right target anymore. It has to be a moving target that takes into the account the new climate and what will grow and what what it's going to trans transition into. That's not easy. It's not all been worked out. BC is moving around, moving fairly quickly on this. Um, I'm just pointing out that these are the mental um, gymnastics that you have to go through. There's a, a change in the rules here. There are a number of adaptive measures that we should try to uh, implement if we want to help species adapt. Um, protected areas are one. Their role changes a bit again. They're not static, uh, but they really play an important role. There's research on how this works. They, they play an in important role in providing refugia for species as they move. Like I said, we need that barrier-free northward or upslope access, and, and protected areas can play a, a big role in that and help these species move along. Uh, on, the, on the rest of the land base, we have to do a better job of reducing the impacts of development. So, you know, the species that are struggling, we have to make sure that they have a fighting chance of uh, dealing with this new threat of climate change, forcing them to change, and that that demands a lot. Uh, and if we make them deal with changing their range, at the same time, they're still struggling with some of the impacts of development. It very likely that combination is going to be deadly for some of them. So um, we definitely need to work harder on that. I've already mentioned the uh, uh, minimizing movement to barrier, the barriers, sorry. Uh, assisted migration. This is early days. A lot of bad examples in the past of people, you know, monkeying around with species. Uh, again, I, I'm not going to go into details here. There's some reason to believe if we're only helping species uh, keep up, like that salamander, we're not really moving it in like the Newfoundland, uh, you know, red squirrel, you know, moving it into the place that doesn't belong and causing all kinds of problems with cross builds. We're, we're really just moving species where they're going anyway and helping them get there before uh, it's too late. So uh, that's a big topic, really mostly in research. Um, not sure if we'll have money to actually tackle that one. And then lastly, I've mentioned this idea of buying time for species to move. We can't put our finger in the dike and stop climate change. We've got at least two degrees of warming coming. We have to uh, accept that that's going to happen and do what we can to help the species move in that short time they have available. It might seem like a long time, the end of the century, but if you're a salamander, you know, it, it, it's going to take a while. We need to do what we can to help them uh, buy some time, slow things down so that they can have enough time to move. Of course, these things are all great, and I'd love to see them all happen. Um, it doesn't look so good. We're doing a really shitty job of minimizing the impacts of development today. I don't know where we're going to redouble, you know, that effort. It's what we need to do if we don't want to lose species, but you know, this is a tough nut. Uh, what that really is saying is that prevention is key. And what I want you to think about is the difference between that two degree guaranteed warming and the six degree worst, worst case. They are enormously different. Uh, one is survivable. Most species should probably make it if, if we keep it to two degrees. If it's six degrees, who knows, right? We can't, we're in uncharted territory. Nobody can predict, but it's going to be ugly and we're going to lose species. I'm not even, I'm not, I'm not talking about all the urban change and there's going to be, you know, it's, it's ugly no matter where you look. I'm talking about the ecosystems. We really, really need to work hard at preventing that worst case and keeping it as low as possible. Uh, it's going to be two, but if we can keep it to between two and three, that would be, that would be awesome. Of course, this is personal, provincial, national, and global. 
Um, there's some good news on the horizon. Um, there is some polling done uh, a couple of months ago. And if you ask Canadians how concerned are they about climate change, 72% are worried or very worried. Um, if that looks like a little bit low to you, it's relative because it keeps on going up. That means the vast majority, a strong majority of people know about climate change. They are, they're not denying. Um, some are, you know, but the, the, the number of people that finally figured out, yes, this is real, this is a problem, is, is, is grown and it's, it's the strong majority of people. So that's a really important thing. Uh, the other piece is interesting is if you ask Albertans here, the other one was about Canadians. If you ask Albertans what they think about climate, and, and this is the question that was asked, are you in favor of a nationwide emissions cap on oil and gas carbon emissions? 60% of Albertans say yes. 60%. That is really interesting. And it's a reason for hope. Unfortunately, <laughs> There are some challenges. Uh, I'm sure you're aware we have a populist premier um, who does not shy away from, you know, saying things that aren't true, and consistently, consistently acts contrary to the broad public interest. Again, you, you can read my my diatribe in the next uh, issue of the magazine where I kind of itemize all these things, pension plans that people don't want, uh, you know, sovereignty. There is a fringe, there is a group, definitely, but the majority, this is not what they're asking for. And so we've got, you've heard today in the news that, you know, Premier Smith is, is you know, taking the feds on about, even though there's 60% of Albertans who want to see climate change tackled, she's taking it on as, as, a, as a demon. This has to be wrestled to the ground and stopped. This is frustrating. It's a problem. If there's a bigger problem, though, I'd say it was this. This is, comes to that Canadian uh, survey. It says only 40% of people say they'd make changes to their daily lives. Uh, they'd only do that if it comes with a... <laughs> Let me try again. Only 40% of people say they make changes to their daily lives if it comes with a cost. So people are worried about climate change, but they don't want to have it cost anything, but it is going to cost something. It's going to be an upheaval. We don't have the option of no cost. You know how much we spent on firefighting this year? And BC was is approaching a billion dollars when you add up all the, all the costs. We don't have a low cost solution to climate change. But people, by and large, they either don't understand, haven't you know, learned the details of it, or they just are refusing to pay for it, which, I mean, frankly, is very selfish, right? It's, it's saying, you know, I'm not going to pay for what the future, I'm not going to be around. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm living for today. And that's how, you know, we have dreamers get away with this stuff at the end, people don't want to pay. So I think that is really the the real the nub of the issue here is that people have to accept that everybody has to step up and you know not idle your car in the winter and turn off your lights and support politicians who do stuff about climate change. The last couple of slides here I have is just that I uh, just I, I this actually came about in context of the renewable energy issue. Um, we know that there's been a strong push in, in Alberta, basically mainly southern Alberta, to advance renewable energy. Um, windmills, though, we know they kill birds, they kill bats. Uh, solar farms chew up habitat. They are a problem. So we have this conundrum. We have a, a very hard trade-off. And um, I, what my perspective is that there's been some kind of knee-jerk. We have to stop these things. Um, all, all uh, very, various sectors of society, but we have to be very careful um, because what we need is a long-term perspective. Um, I know, for example, we had the Frank Lake solar farm issue uh, and it was stopped um, and, and for good reasons. And there was a celebration for its stopping. But if we don't slow down or, you know, keep climate change to a quote livable limit, Frank Lake will dry up just like the rest of them. So it's it's a short term kind of fix. We can't sidestep it and say we, you know, we're not going to have these solar farms and windmills because they do damage. 
you, you have to weigh the trade-offs between you know what if we don't act on climate change and, and the damage that renewable resources uh, have um, and the answer really is um, careful planning let's figure out how we can construct these things where are we going to put them you know, we shouldn't be putting it beside frank lake but there are no regulations there's no guidance I mean, we, we do a really 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 bad job of planning uh, regional planning alberta and that's the way to fix things and um, a number of environmental groups uh, led by Pembina and, and nature alberta was along uh, just wrote in on this uh, you know the the government is working on this and again in the, in, in the online you'll see we have uh, in our, our issues section there's a, some background and you know we encourage people to write in and 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 try to put some pressure on let's go forward but let's do it right so with that uh yeah i'm i'm finished i just want to say if you're so keen and you want to dive into the details this all all the information i'm showing here most of it comes from a report it's a long one it's like 100 pages search the title online um alberta's natural subregions under a changing climate past present future if you want a more digestible version uh uh, Steph told you that my book is now available for free uh, at the University of Alberta Library. They're kindly hosted it. And if you jump to chapter nine, it's all about climate change. It talks in uh, detail about the things I spoke of here today, um, some of them in more depth, and it's in a very accessible format. And that's it. I've <laughs> I think Wonderful. I've not gone over time, and uh, <laughs> I'm very open to questions. Thanks so much, Rick. Um, if everyone wants to put a clapping emoji in their little black box by their name, I'm just going to end the recording and we'll take some questions.